Hello, everyone. Welcome to our latest uh, Queen Elizabeth Scholarship webinar. Uh, we are coming to you from the Master Health Forum at Master University in Hamilton, Ontario, or at least some of us are. Some of you are joining us remotely, including our uh, guest speaker for today, and uh, she will explain where she is and what she's doing uh, very shortly. A very quick agenda for the work that we're going to be doing today. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Master Health Forum, a little bit about the scholarship program, and then I'm going to introduce you to uh, our speaker for today, uh, who's did some great work and is still doing great work in Ghana. So uh, the Master Health Forum, uh, we are a leading hub for improving health outcomes through collective problem solving. We aim to harness, harness information, convene stakeholders, prepare action-oriented leaders in an effort to be an agent of change by empowering stakeholders. The Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program is run by a partnership between Rideau Hall Foundation, Community Foundations of Canada, Universities Canada, and Canadian Universities. The purpose is to activate a dynamic community of young global leaders across the Commonwealth to create lasting impacts both at home and abroad through cross-cultural exchanges encompassing international education, discovery and inquiry, and professional experiences. At the McMaster Health Forum, our Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program is entitled Strengthening Health Systems. Uh, this allows our scholars to contribute to strengthening health systems and become part of our large and growing network of health system leaders. Our first cohort uh, has come and gone and done all great work abroad, and there's the list of them there, uh, and you'll be hearing from one of these people today. Our current cohorts are looking to go primarily in the summer, with some going in the fall, uh, with more to come in the winter and summer of 2018. Our speaker today is Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda is a, a graduate student in the Global Health Master's of Science program at McMaster. Her research interests are focused on non-communicable diseases in sub-Saharan Africa, with a particular emphasis on mental health disorders and breast cancer. Rhonda traveled to Ghana as part of her scholarship to collect data for her thesis on the mental health, quality of life, and life experiences of Ghanaian women living with breast cancer, and she hopes to apply the knowledge learned from her thesis to improve the health systems in Canada and sub-Saharan African countries. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Rhonda, and Rhonda is actually joining us remotely. She is still in Ghana. Uh, doing some uh, extension of her work there. Uh, so Rhonda, I will turn it over to you. Hi, good evening. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, my name is Rhonda, as uh, James mentioned. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you very much, James, for the introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to be presenting my thesis, what I worked on, which was titled, as James said, Mental Health, Quality of Life, and Life Experiences of Ghanaian Women Living with Breast Cancer. So again, as James mentioned, I um, came to Ghana uh, to do my, my research. I worked at the Peace and Love Hospital. So there's two branches of this hospital. There's one in Accra and there's one in Kumasi. So I was mainly based in Kumasi because that's where the headquarters is. Um, so I did the majority of my work. What we do is once a month we come to Accra. So right now, at the beginning of the month, we always spend in Accra. Right now I am in Accra. Um, so Again, and I worked for the. I was here from June to October of last year as part of my scholarship uh, to collect data. And um, once I was done collecting data and completed my thesis, I decided to come back. I was hired back to do research and policy here. Um, so right now, the focus is very much on breast cancer because that's what the Peace and Love Hospital specializes in. Um, but the hope is to ex extend the work to uh, non-communicable diseases. Um, I also, uh, there is also an NGO as part of Peace and Love Hospital called Breast Care International, uh, where we go throughout Ghana, travel throughout the country, and, and uh, do breast cancer screenings. So just to give you an overview of the Ghanaian healthcare system, in 2003, uh, the National Health Insurance Scheme uh, was adopted to replace the cash and carry system, which was uh, the pay for service uh, fee-for-service uh, system that they had. Um, it actually covers about 95% of the disease, of all disease conditions that affect Ghanaians. Uh, the types of hospitals that we have, uh, we have the private facilities, which make up nearly 1,300 of the facilities uh, that we have. Uh, these hospitals, one thing that is quite unique um, is that they can choose to accept NHIS or not uh, for any of the patients that come. There are certain places where you, you a private hospital can don't accept uh, the health insurance. So uh, that's one thing that's unique to, to Ghana. 
um, we have about 800 public hospitals. So public hospitals have to carry, have to accept NHIS. Um, the thing that's particular with both private and public hospitals is that they're mainly located in the urban area, so Takrati, Kumasi, Accra, Tamale. Uh, what you see operating usually in rural areas tend to be the more religious institutions, uh, generally uh, Christian or Muslim, which are, there's about 204. Uh, those ones are the ones that you mainly see in rural areas. So problems within the system. Although it's, it's the NHIS that's here in Ghana is quite unique to the continent. There's not many countries that have this type of service. Um, does, we cannot, though, just mention it without saying some of the issues that are currently occurring right now. Uh, so there are some financing issues to the causing for um, to the cash and care. Um, there's also more of a focus on treatment rather than prevention and screening. So the diagnostics aren't covered uh, by the NHIS, but treatment for certain cancers, for certain conditions are covered. Um, there's also another issue with the healthcare system is the lack of specialized hospitals. Um, so some people might go to a specific general hospital uh, with a certain disease and might not be, uh, I should say, might not get their disease actually recognized or get the proper treatment because they're not at the right hospital. And sometimes there, there is some issues with referral. Another really interesting issue going on right, right now is the imbalance in the healthcare professionals' opportunities. Uh, so I made a different decision. For the last, um, I think, it was 2012 statistics, uh, there was about 2,000 uh, doctors for the whole country. Um, but one thing that's a recent phenomenon that's happening is that there's a lot of jobless nurses. So there was a lot of trained nurses um, that are ready to go, graduate and everything, that are currently job jobless and have not been able to um, been hired anywhere, although uh, they are needed. So if we take more of a focus on breast cancer in Ghana, breast cancer is the second most common cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa, as a Sub-Saharan African woman. Um, the thing that's different from West Africa, uh, from the Western world and, and the, the continent, Sub-Saharan African continent, is that we tend to see breast cancer um, peak between the ages of 35 and 45 years old, which is about 10 years earlier than in higher income countries. And not only are these affecting women, is, is breast cancer occurring in women at a younger age, but they have a more, uh, there's a poor prognosis due to the late presentation. So in Ghana, 60 to 70 percent of our cases arrive over at age three and four. Not only that, on top of the, the, the um, late presentation, the lower age of incidence, um, lower age of, uh, of occurrence, um, we also have more aggressive tumor types. So we tend to have the triple negative tumor types, um, so ER negative, uh, PR, so es uh, estrogen receptor negative, progesterone um, receptor negative, and the HER2 uh, receptor negative as well which makes um, responding to the different hormone therapies that are available for a cancer very, very difficult. And then well, another thing that we're seeing is almost nearly a 50% mortality. So for the, for the incidence, we have about 26 cases per 100,000 per year, and a mortality of 12 um, per 100,000 individuals per year. Whereas you see something along the lines in Western and high income countries of 77 per 100,000 people and a mortality rate of 14 uh, per 100,000 people. So one of the great things, though, that Ghana currently has is that breast cancer treatment is covered by NHIS. Um, it's, only, it's one of only two cancers that is covered by NHIS. So you have breast cancer and cervical cancer. Again, I want to mention once more that um, it's the treatment that is covered, not the actual screening. Uh, mammographies are not covered. Biopsies to actually diagnose the type of malignancy or if you have breast cancer at all is not covered by NHIS either. According to, according to WHO, 
there's about uh, 650,000 people that are suffering from severe mental disorder. And in a population of 26 million, there is about 2.1 million people who are suffering from moderate to mild mental disorder. The most common disorder is depression and anxiety, which is also, uh, just like breast cancer, most common in women and in impoverished women. There's a 98% treatment gap. So in 100 people with a disorder, only two people will actually be receiving treatment. Um, this is mainly due to lack of funding, limited, clini limited clinicians, both psychologists and psychiatrists, um, not a lot of researchers in the, in the field as well. Um, and overall, on the political level, on the national health system level, um, it's a low priority. Um, in African states, there are currently 40% of African states actually have a mental health policy. And about 20% of that have actually gone ahead and implemented the policy as well. So one, one step in the right direction in Ghana was the mental health bill, which was introduced in 2012. Um, it replaced one of the first mental health uh, bills that we had in Ghana, which was the Mental Health Act, which had a huge emphasis. That act had an emphasis on institutional, institutionalizing um, individuals versus home care. So the mental health bill had more of an emphasis on delivery of better quality mental health care in the home um, and also had more emphasis on protection, protection of human rights and mental health disorders in Ghana. Um, so there's actually, uh, again, this is a step in the right direction, as I, I can say. Um, has it been, have we seen a difference yet? Not yet, but again, it, it's, it's, it's still a step in the right direction. So we'll work with that. Um, so in terms of the overall background, the burden, there seems to be a bi-directional relationship between cancer and psychological distress. So the burden of cancer can cause distress. There is weak evidence that psychological distress can cause cancer, but there has been research that shows that it can negatively impact prognosis. Mainly, um, it can also negatively impact the recurrence of cancer. It can compromise the immune system and also compromise adherence to treatment. So my research question was looking at are Ghanaian women living with breast cancer more susceptible to psychological distress than their healthy counterparts? And do they have lower quality of life? Also, how do their lived experiences affect their mental health? So just an overview of, of my design. I did a sequ sequential explanatory design, so I didn't mix method. I started with the quantitative. Um, it was a cross-sectional study, which um, I recruited 64 healthy women and 64 breast cancer patients to participate. Uh, they, all of them completed the Kessler Psychological Distress Scale, and they also completed the WHO Quality of Life Breast. Among those 64 breast cancer patients, 13 women were selected for semi-structured interviews uh, using the phenomenology methodology, which really focuses on understanding lived experiences. So out of the many uh, variables that I looked at, the independent variables were cancer diagnosis, uh, age, education, marital status, and cancer treatment. Now in the outcomes, there was many. Uh, from the WHO quality of life breath, there was four main domains. Uh, so the physical health, psychological well-being, social relationship, environment, quality of life, oh sorry, environment, those are the four main domains, and then there was computed scores for quality of life, satisfaction with health, and overall satisfaction with quality of life and health. Now with the K-10, um, the variable there was psychological distress. So if we look at our results, um, the significant results that we got when we compared uh, breast cancer patients to healthy controls. Overall, breast cancer patients were less satisfied with their health and quality of life. In terms, they also had, uh, they scored lower on the physical health domain. So they were more de dependent on medical treatment, they had less energy, they had more difficulty getting around, 
they had more physical pain, which prevented them from doing what they needed to do. They were less satisfied with their ability to perform their daily living activities, and they were less satisfied with their capacity, their capacity for work. They also scored lower for environment. So they had less access to information that they needed for their day-to-day -day life. They had less opportunities for leisure activities. Their physical, they felt as though their physical environment was less healthy as well. They felt as though they did not have enough money to meet their needs. And they also felt um, significantly less safe in their daily lives. So on the social relationship domain, there was no significant difference between breast cancer patients and the healthy controls. For psychological distress, though, there was a significant difference. Breast cancer patients felt more nervous. They felt more restless. Uh, they often felt more depressed. And they um, also felt like everything was an effort. And in terms of their psychological well-being, um, they rated their life as less meaningful. Um, they felt as though they experienced negative feelings such as blue mood, despair, anxiety, and depression more often. Uh, they, were, they had more difficulty accepting their bodily appearances, and they were less satisfied with themselves. So within the breast cancer, uh, within the breast cancer population, I was looking to see what other demographic factors may be influencing uh, the, the results on these uh, outcome variables. So one interesting one was education, as could be expected also. Um, so women who were more educated scored higher on psychological well-being, and they scored higher on the quality of life. One thing that's interesting about education, education can also be a confounding variable for income, which I did not look at. But um, women who are who were more educated tend to have um, a higher paying job. They were teachers. They were doctors in their own right. They were um, professionals. So that is that can be uh, one of the you know reasons why they would tend to have a higher quality of life. Um, Another interesting finding was that the older the person was, the higher they scored on for social relationships, and old, old, the, the older the person was, the higher they scored for quality of life as well. Now, I looked at treatment. One of the typical, um, the typical treatment for breast cancer patients here in Ghana is first they go on chemotherapy. Some, depending on the state, again, most women come 60 to 70 percent of our cases, they're at stage three, stage four. So more likely than not, they're going to get breast surgery, whether it's just a lumpectomy where they remove the lump, or a full mastectomy where the, the entire breast is removed. So they receive breast surgery. Um, and then a lot of women also go on and get referred to getting uh, radiation done, radiotherapy. And then they um, also, a lot of women will go on hormone tablets uh, for and do hormone therapy for a very long time, even after they're actually cured. It's just to make sure that they don't go back into or redevelop, have a recurrence, essentially. So within uh, the cancer treatments, three uh, significant factors were chemotherapy, breast surgery, and radiotherapy. So with chemotherapy, those who were on chemotherapy rated their quality of life, had a lower, scored lower on quality of life. Those who received uh, breast surgery, on the other hand, had higher quality of life, rated, scored higher on quality of life, scored higher for satisfaction with health, and they also self-reported themselves uh, higher for overall satisfaction with health and quality of life. For radiotherapy, what, there was a bit of a contradiction, which I found, found was interesting. Could not really explain it, but still was interesting. Um, they had a higher level of psychological well-being at the same time as having higher levels of psychological distress. They also had higher satisfaction with health, and they scored higher uh, for overall satisfaction with health and, and quality of life. 
Now, if we look at my qualitative findings, which were done with this true semi-structured interview with the 13 women, um, there was kind of a, a tempor temporal um, journey with the women that was going on. Um, so women at the, I tried to, what, what we used for the, for the qualitative um, aspect of it was more of an extreme variation. So you had women of different uh, times in their breast cancer journey. So those who had just began to those who were near done, had done their surgery, was on radiotherapy and just coming for checkups. So what you would, what I, I was usually seeing was, um, what, what I usually saw was four steps. So breast cancer knowledge and suspicion. Then there was a navigation through the health system. To then an impact, we saw the impact and uh, of breast cancer in different ways. And a really interesting and very encouraging um, step was the regaining of confidence for certain women. For breast cancer uh, knowledge and suspicion, it re really varied with the women. So you had women who had never heard of cancer, you had women who heard a little bit of cancer, about cancer, and then you had women who had knowledge. Uh, one thing that was interesting is a lot of the women who did have some knowledge about breast cancer, they heard it through breast cancer campaign. Uh, so on the radio or they've heard, you know, there was an initiative or an education that was going on at their church or in the community that they went to. Um, and then there was also some who knew about it because they had a family member who went through it. So this one lady, her quote was, I heard some people got breast cancer, but I don't know anything about it. What most people acknowledge to be their, um, what caused suspicion was pain and feeling the lumps in the breast. And then came the next step of navigating the health system. So one thing that was quite common as well was actually, um, as expressed in this quote, is actually when I detected the lump in my breast, I didn't, I didn't know where to go. So one woman in particular, she actually went through three nodes of care. She was referred to uh, from one hospital to another. Then the hospital referred her to another one, which was to the teaching hospital. She had a very negative experience there, um, and then she ended up at Peace and Love Hospital. And that wasn't uncommon. I had at least, out of 13, two, three women where they went to at least two nodes of care before ending up at um, Peace and Love and actually starting treatment. Um, so one of the first common reactions for these women are fear and sadness, uh, which is, again, those are the common first reactions. Um, and not knowing where to go as they navigate the healthcare system. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there's not that many, there's not that many specialized uh, health facilities, right? So for breast cancer, Peace and Love is one of the most well-known in Ghana. Um, there's Korlebu in Accra, and there's Comfort Noche in, in Kumase. But that is, um, those are in the main two cities, right? So. Also, there are those living outside the city centers have a lot of difficulty getting their treatment. So a lot of the impact of breast cancer. Um, for this woman, she received a mastectomy. So without the silicone to support me, if I leave it with half, I feel like people will see it and say something. Breast cancer, it goes without saying, had a major impact on a lot of these women, on their everyday life, on their physical health, inability to eat, mood swings, loss of substantial amount of weight and pain. It had an effect on them psychologically, um, so their female identity felt compromised, for, especially women who had mastectomies and only had that one breast. Uh, for some women, it felt their female identity was also attached to their roles and responsibilities as a mother, and they felt as though um, they couldn't accomplish their roles as wives, as mothers, because of the breast cancer, because of the effect of the cancer. A lot of the women had financial hardships as well. Um, so traveling for treatment, especially for the women who are living outside of these city centers, is in itself quite costly. And um, the treatment itself, although covered by NHIS, it's not completely free. So for women having to take a day off, having to, having to pay for transportation, and having to to, to pay for the medication could be quite difficult. Um, and virtually all my women, all the women who participated in the study expressed that sentiment. 
In terms of access to medication, um, again, it goes along with access to treatment. Um, if you're not in the city centers, it's very difficult to get the medication. Um, so that was another uh, thing that was addressed. So the last step. When I came, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. As I said initially, it wasn't easy, but with the treatment, and now that I am feeling better, I think I can see some changes. So I'm glad I am better as compared to when I started. So a lot of the women uh, were reporting when they reached the step, and these tended to be the women who were more the, nearer to the ending of their uh, breast cancer journey, women who have already gone through the breast surgery, women who were on radiation or were on hormone therapy. Um, there was this regaining of confidence, which was quite uh, moving and uh, very gives a lot of hope, really. Um, so the, a lot of the, almost virtually all my women received one type of support, whether that was emotionally, financially, and physically. So physically, for example, one woman, um, she was receiving financial support from her church members, and whenever her church members were able to, they would also physically drop her off at the hospital, which was a, a huge help to her. In terms of coping mechanism, uh, the three most common ones, I think religion was the number one. Religion was definitely the one, number one within all my women. Um, uh, you know, praying, going to church if they could. Um, if they physically couldn't go to church, then they would be at home um, and, and, and go through, you know, their personal relationship with God was very, very important to them. Some of my women also did exercise, which was great. Um, again, a lot of there's a lot of impact on their physical health, so it was more of a you know going around the house and um, you know yeah mainly going around the house, doing a little bit of uh, small fast-paced walking around um, their neighborhood as well with one. And um, one thing that was very helpful for the women was counseling services, which are offered here at the hospital, which is great. So overall, in summary, uh, breast cancer patients perform poor on many outcomes, so on physical health and satisfaction with health, on psychological well-being, envir their environment. Um, they had higher uh, psychological distress, and overall their satisfaction with health and uh, quality of life was lower. What we were seeing, though, in terms of uh, what we, one thing that was, and interesting was that it was probably very uh, difficult and heavy at the beginning of the breast cancer journey and slowly improved with time. So in terms of my recommendations, um, it's more focused on patient-centered care approaches. So improving access to treatment, um, be it psychiatric treatment um, or for the breast cancer itself. So with drug delivery, um, if we can emphasize on improving the, 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 the access the women can have to their, their medication to improve their, their conditions, uh, that would be one step. Access to psychologists and psychiatrists and counselors as well. Um, and also the availability of psychiatric medicine can definitely um, go a long way. Patient education is also one that can certainly can, might be a uh, effective in helping with um, psychological well-being, making and physical, physical uh, health as well. So making sure these women understand the side effects of their treatment, um, having someone that they can speak to to give them advice and tips as to how to overcome some of the effects that they're going through. One of the variables that I wanted to look at was clinical uh, with cancer stage. A lot of the women didn't know what age or grade they were at. So I think almost knowing the clinical dating grade for the patient might not be their number one priority um, just because, you know, for them it's about getting better and all that. But any um, survivorship plan that you, that you see, it does recommend having clinical staging grades there. One thing that the emphasis needs to be on and making sure that any relevant information that would provide patients with more knowledge as to their condition uh, with, with it being um, 
you know, likelihood of survival or um, the exact step that they need to take in order to improve uh, their, their health condition is, is very important. In terms of counseling services, I just wanted to note a, a, a service that we have here that I think is very innovative and um, is making a difference is the Helping Others Through Personal Experience, which is a peer navigation program where you have survivors calling newly diagnosed patients and guiding them through their, their breast cancer journey. We are looking into also starting the integrating a nurse, the nurse, uh, not nurse navigators into the peer navigation program so that women can be in their local area and have a local nurse that they can contact if they're having any effects or um, side effects or any difficulties, and then the nurse, if, needs, if she needs further assistance, can then contact us um, through kind of an mHealth um, initiative. One thing that's important, as mentioned, as I, I found, was that this treatment and these approaches is especially crucial at the beginning of the cancer journey. Now, another um, recommendation that I deem extremely important um, is increasing breast cancer awareness. Um, not only understanding the signs and women understanding the signs and symptoms can go a long way in downstaging the the cancers that we're seeing. So reducing uh, that number of 60 to 70 percent of our cases already being in stage three, stage four. Um, so me, women being able to detect any issues early. Also making sure that these women know the resources that they have so that when they're navigating through the health system, they're not going through two or three care nodes before they reach uh, the appropriate node for care. And then another initiative is to, in general, reduce social stigma. That goes a long way uh, for especially the psychological well-being of our patients, uh, feeling that they're incomplete, feeling that you know they'll be rejected from their family or from the community, uh, feeling that people will talk about them. If we have more people aware of breast cancer, knowing that it's not a curse, that it's not communicable, that you know these women need help, they don't need judgment, uh, that could definitely go a long way in helping the, uh, our patients. So some of the initiatives that we have uh, that Breast, cancer, Breast Care International does outreach programs. So we, again, travel throughout the country and do breast cancer screenings and education. Uh, once a year, we have Walk for the Cure, which happens in October. Uh, we also, uh, some of the past initiatives that we've had was, uh, sorry, was the Community Breast Health Promoters Educate uh, Workshop, where we had uh, where we had women from uh, Pres Presbyterian wives uh, come and get trained into uh, detecting breast cancer, um, learning at the different other breast diseases. Uh, that they should be looking for because women are, uh, um, because again, Ghana is a very, <laughs> sorry, Ghana is a very uh, religious country, so you would, the, one of the best places to um, to educate the women, one of the best places for, um, one of the best resources is to go to, into the churches and educating women and to educate uh, these women leaders into being able to recognize these symptoms. One thing also is that there is no oncology training for nurses. So I just my acknowledges acknowledgement of my supervisors, Dr. Shannon and Dr. Williams. I also want to thank my boss now, uh, Dr. Beatrice Ade, um, for and the Peace and Love Hospital for their assistance, for allowing me to speak with the patient. Um, I want to thank Dr. Christy Tombe and the other. All right. Well, thank you very much, Rhonda. You, you broke up a little bit at the end there. Uh, I don't know if that was just unique to us here at the forum where it's a very rainy day or if it was uh, true for everybody oh. online. Um, but I think we got the gist of what you said, so thank you very much. Uh, I will open it up now to questions. Uh, okay. so those of you who are here in the room with me, at the health forum, uh, you know, just put your hand up and I will, I will repeat your question for those online. If you are currently joining us online, then I'm going to ask that you please type your question in the chat box uh, and then I will read them out for those, uh, for the benefit of the recording that we are going to be posting on YouTube a little bit later. So uh, at this point, while people are thinking, I'll, uh, I'll ask you the first question, Rhonda. So I'll, 
ask you a, a, a you know health systems related question since that is the basis of our program. So I was curious about the the Mental Health Act that came in in 2012. What uh, what do you think was mm -hmm. the the biggest impact that it had on the system in Ghana at the time and and in the uh, you know the five years since? One of the things that they did differently. Um, as opposed to the act from 1972 is they also enacted a mental um, they also enacted a mental health board a board authority which really is seeking to implement all the um, implement all the activities that's outlined in the act um, I would say that the main thing would be that it's recognizing that mental illness is not it's recognizing on the policy level that mental illness is not a disease that all you need to do is institutionalize people. Um, it's more of making, it gives more of that respect and that um, giving more of a human right to uh, to the patient. Um, I think that's, that's the main thing on the policy level. In reality, it's still, there's still a lot to, that needs to be done though, but at least health and wise, uh, policy wise, it's there, it's written in stone. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question online, so I will read it for you. Uh, for these recommendations to be implemented would require money. From your knowledge, is there a drive from the government to put in money towards breast cancer care? That's a very good question. Um, as of right now, <laughs> that's very difficult to say, right, because Essentially, there's a lot going on um, in the government-wise. Is there, there's a lot of, I'm trying to find a very good way of answering this question. There's a drive. There's a want to assist in breast cancer. And we see it with the politicians, especially when they invite us to come to their communities and speak to the women in their area. So you have these district chiefs, chiefs. You have these ministers, regional ministers, calling us, coming to these programs that we have. So the, the, the want to assist there, is the financial means there? As of right now, not yet. But the fact that it's already, that it's on the agenda is already a, a step into, towards the right, into the right direction. So um, hopefully in the future, uh, it, we, we can do that. The, the emphasis is still more on communicable diseases. Also, we're, although we're seeing that transition where non-communicable diseases such as uh, high cholesterol and hypertension and diabetes are getting, and cancers are getting more attention, we're not there yet, unfortunately. But again, there's hope for the future and hopefully um, the emphasis gets there. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, another question online. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. What sort of impact do you think your findings and recommendations will have on these women? So what I'm hoping is that um, a lot of the findings were kind of expected, although it's nice to kind of have that research that has been done and conducted, because there's also a lack of research being done both in breast cancer and in mental health. So to be able to combine the two definitely helps, especially if we're looking at uh, evidence-based uh, policies, right? So what um, what I'm doing right now is I'm a research and policy coordinator. What I'm hoping to do is adopt, so like the nurse nurse navigation program would go under my jurisdiction, like would be one uh, program that I would be coordinating as, uh, as part of my position. So I'm definitely going to be using a lot of the research, putting a, a more emphasis on, um, putting more emphasis on the facts that I found in my research and making sure that these peer navigators are aware of these of, of these and kind of have more um, strategies as to how to deal with it because I think the, the work that I did gives me a very gives a very good overview of one, what women are going through so to be able to uh, better train these peer navig the current peer navigators and the nurse uh, nurse navigating program once it's implemented I think would definitely help these women in that sense. Um, so I'm sort of continuing my work, not necessarily uh, the research that I was doing. I'm going to be working on other research, and, and I'm looking to um, improve, in, looking to also push more policy in breast cancer and cancer and non-communicable diseases as a whole. 
what prompted me to go back after my internship. Um, I love it in Ghana. <laughs> I'm very comfortable here. I feel like there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And um, I think that I can, I can have, you know, uh, I can contribute positively to the people here and to, uh, to, to the health system here, basically. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we have another question online. Uh, do you know if there are any support systems in Canada to help Canadian women with breast cancer that could potentially be implemented in Ghana? That's a very good question. I haven't looked into it um, extensively. It most More of the ones that we've seen are the peer navigator programs. That's one of the, the what I've noticed, what I've seen in Canada that has been already implemented and that we are implementing here. Um, but I haven't seen any others that, uh, that I found could be essentially done here yet. Um, again, I haven't looked into it more, but I think that I should definitely give it a, give it more of a, of a look, look see. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question online. Uh, I was just wondering about the NHIS not covering screening because I would think that early diagnosis is equally important. What are the measures in place to encourage early screening? And also, are there any efforts being made at the moment to get the NHIS to cover screening? Right. So covering screening is one of the policies that I'm, one of the uh, policies that I'm working on, one of the projects I'm working on. Um, so really getting that dialogue going on. Uh, you're right. It's, it's very surprising. One of the things that we do is we do offer free breast cancer screenings at these different events. Um, that throughout the country. However, it, 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 it has, doing clinical breast examinations has helped in detecting uh, suspicious cases. Um, converting those women to, you know, suspicious cases and actually having them come to the hospital has been difficult, but uh, we're doing the best that we can. So we are pushing to have screenings covered. For the main, for the for the moment, mammographies are extremely expensive and not really available. So what we're hoping to do is to have them cover um, clinical breast examinations uh, at least. So for the women to be able to go get those clinical breast examinations uh, free of charge. One thing that would also need to be done for it to be more effective, if we want the screening to be done, is to have more people trained on how to do a clinical breast exam, a breast examination and also to have more women know how to do self-breast examinations as well. Um, so that's what we're pushing for as of right now. All right, thank you very much. So we do actually have uh, somebody in the room who has a question, so uh, just tell me the question and then I'll repeat it off for those online. Okay, so the question has to do with um, the, the more national health-related uh, system in Ghana and its relationship and the dynamics between them and the more um, traditional uh, healers that you would, you would find probably more in the rural settings. So how do those okay. two uh, work together in Ghana? So it actually works pretty well. Um, so the, one of the, okay, so it works well and it doesn't work well at the same time. So what we're finding is that there tends to be Women going to see traditional healers is one of the main um, factors into why we are getting our cases later, which is one of the main reasons. They go to the traditional healers. They feel as though um, they're getting treatment, but their situation is becoming worse, and then they finally say, you know what, I'm going to go to a doctor, and, but they're already at stage four, stage, stage three, stage four. So in that sense, it, it, it's really bad. Um, one thing, though, is that for some women, they don't use traditional healing as traditional methods as their main treatment. They use it to more to relieve the side effects. And there is also, by law, um, traditional healers cannot say to patients that their treatment cures cancer. Is that what's done on the ground? That's another debate. but. By law, we have that law in place to say that they cannot do that. So what we are seeing is having more of a collaborative dialogue with these, with the traditional healers and with ourselves, medical professionals, to make sure that we're not um, aggravating the situation for these, for these, the, the, their conditions are, that we're not aggravating the situation for these, for these women. Um, 
so in that sense, uh, which is good. So women who are seeing these traditional healers for their side effects um, have been shown to, I've spoken with some women and they've said it's been quite beneficial. Um, the main issue is making sure that these women are not seeing them first before they come to the, medic to, 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 um, to the hospital for actual like, treatment for the breast cancer. Thank you. Uh, another question online. Um, speaking of screening and training individuals to do their own breast examinations, are there any current public health measures taken for breast cancer in Ghana? Nationwide, there isn't yet. Uh, there isn't a, um, there's not even a breast cancer policy as of yet, uh, or cancer policy as of yet. Um, but we're, again, we're hoping to work on that. The public health initiatives that we have going on are mainly NGOs, um, NGOs such as Breast Care International, such as Peace and Love, and other um, NGOs as well working on uh, breast cancer screenings and um, teaching women how to do breast self-examination. Uh, any other questions from anybody in the room or anybody online? Okay, so th this is a very uh, academic question. It's, you've done a master's thesis, so now what are you going to do with that academic work? So. Uh, academically, um, how will you translate that information into, you know, where you're working and the work that you're doing now? Okay. Um, well, I'm I'm using the work to support a lot of the projects um, uh, projects that we have going on in programs. So, as I mentioned, hopefully using this work to um, better train uh, the peer navigators that we have, um, the professionals that work here as well. Um, and then in terms of personally how I'm translating the research to the general population would be um, conferences and I'm hoping to publish the work um, in the next few months as well. Excellent. And you have a conference presentation coming up. I do. That's going to be at Harvard. So I'm traveling to Boston at the end of the month. It's called the Global Health Catalyst Summit. I'm really excited about that. Excellent. Uh, so, any other questions? Anybody in the room or online? I think uh, people are starting to wind down a little bit. Um, okay. Anything you wanted to add, Rhonda, that you feel that uh, would be lacking if you didn't add it? No, not at all. Again, I'm, I, I like Matthew's question of kind of looking at the different uh, interventions and support systems in Canada that could probably be implemented in Ghana. If anyone is interested in my work or is it has some ideas that you know they would like to discuss with me please feel free um, we're always looking for new ideas uh, more research uh, projects that can go on more policy initiatives that um, that can definitely benefit the women here and I just want to say thank you to everyone who uh, who joined the, my presentation today uh, I think we'll uh, we'll draw it to a close at this point. So I want to uh, thank you again, Rhonda, for joining us all the way from Ghana and uh, doing your webinar remotely. Um, it worked out quite well. I want to thank everybody for joining us online. Those of you who joined me here at the forum in Hamilton, I'll uh, draw your attention really quickly to the links on the screen. The first one is to our scholarship program. So if you're interested in applying to the scholarship program, that's the link that you would go to for information. The second link is our QE Scholar Insights page where it lists uh, all of the uh, webinars such as this one, uh, links to blog posts, uh, links to recordings when they're available, and speaking of blogs, that third link is the link to our blog page. All of our forum scholars, along with their webinars, will also be writing blogs which get posted there. Um, and that's it. So again, thank you very much, Rhonda, and thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, we're going to do it all again at the same time next week. So thanks again, everyone. <laughs>